Okay, um, so this is actually one of my favorite topics. I've done a lot of, um, over the years, a lot of reading and research on sample. So what I want to give you today is just a little bit of a flavor of who Sam Paul is, what he's about, why do we even care, and why do we want to know about him. And just so you know, a lot of these things we could talk about, I could talk about Sam Paul for the next eight weeks. So what we're talking about today is just a small um, sampling, just to give you a little bit um, of a feel of why you would want to read more about him. So just to start, go all the way back. So St. Paul, as you know, um, originally his name was Saul. So Saul was his Jewish name. Just to give a quick background, I have some slides that we'll go through just because some people like to take notes, um, but nothing else um, more on the slides. Um, his name was Saul. That was his Jewish name. Remember, Saul, as a young man, he grew up. Uh, his father uh, was a fairly wealthy uh, person um, who had purchased the Roman citizenship. And um, purchasing the Roman citizenship becomes a very relevant part of St. Paul's mission as we'll see. Um, you know, at that time, having the Roman Empire um, around, you know, the southern part of the Europe, northern Africa, West, southwest Asia, becomes part of the reason why Christianity was able to spread so quickly by the works of people like St. Paul. And we'll see that too. So he begins we get introduced to him in the book of Acts in chapter 9. I love chapter 9, I love those first few verses because they really kind of frame not just who St. Paul is and becomes, but who we as Christians are and what we hope to become. Um, so he begins his life as the zealous Jew who is a Pharisee, a rabbi, you might say, who is very well educated in Judaism. He really know, knew the scripture of the Old Testament or of the Torah. He taught it and he was very zealous about it. He could not stand the idea of anyone else um, contradicting that scripture or speaking against the scripture. So to him, this whole Christian movement was just outright an outrage, okay? He couldn't take it to the point where he persecuted Christians. Now remember, this was a man of God. He knew God. He knew who he was, or he thought, and he knew what to teach about him. God was his topic, okay? This was his passion. So, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm really consolidating a lot of this. So, we get introduced to him in chapter 9 in the book of Acts. I'll read this to you um, from verse, specifically from verse 3 to 6. Just so you know, verse 3 to 6, there are books written on verses 3 to 6. So, what we're talking about here is just a sampling. So we get introduced to him in chapter 9, and we find that he's about to take this journey, okay? And the purpose of his journey, he's going to Damascus, uh, you know, the largest city in Syria. And the reason and the goal of that journey is to find Christians, arrest them, persecute them, and maybe, you know, kill them, okay? because he loves God and he was defending God. So in the beginning of his journey, in verse three in chapter nine, you should have this like highlighted in your Bible. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus 
Now remember, he's riding on a horse. You can't see it that much. He's riding on a horse. This is how we get introduced to him. Followed by soldiers. He's a great man riding high on his horse. This is both kind of a visual, physical re reality. He's riding on a horse. But it's also sort of like when you tell someone they're riding on their high horse. That's how we're introduced to him. Now listen to this. As he journeyed and he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he begins and we first see him with this, there's a light. He sees a light, okay? And this is our lives as Christians. Sometimes we don't realize, and again, the, the point is, is we we're, we're talking today a little bit about what can we learn from St. Paul? Why do we need to know about him? Um, so he sees a light, he's engulfed by a light. All of us as Christians, we begin our journey, our Christian journey, our orthodox journey, engulfed by this light in baptism, okay? The Holy Spirit, remember the book of Acts, the whole purpose of the book of Acts is to talk about the works of the Holy Spirit, not just in the lives of the apostles, but in our lives. And St. Paul, I look at him as his life, not just a bunch of travels and missions, but it really is the works of the Holy Spirit through the works of St. Paul. Okay? So let's think about it that way. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is very sometimes, we don't give the Holy Spirit enough of credit. It is almost like underrated, okay? From the part, three parts of the Trinity, a lot of times we forget about the Holy Spirit and how powerful the Holy Spirit is. So he, he sees this light, the voice speaks to him, and he said, who are you, Lord? What I love about this verse is, again, as Christians, we're in church, we go to so all sorts of, we hear sermons and all these things and maybe we're Sunday school teachers or we're doing other things and we think we know God because we're doing all these things. But St. Paul himself, this great teacher of God, sees God in front of him and he asks, who are you, Lord? There's a lot of significance in that. Because a lot of times, we see this also in the book of Job, it's a topic for another time, where he thought he knew God, and it wasn't until he goes through that whole journey, and we all know we're not going to get into it, that at the end he says, now I see you. So St. Paul is knocked off his horse, his high horse, because he thought he knew everything there was to know. And when he's knocked down to the ground, God is in front of him. He's all around him. He's engulfed in him. And he asks, who are you, Lord? He doesn't know, okay? Then, I only have about 75 slides. This is the second one, okay? <laughs> but don't get scared. Okay? <laughs> We're going to consolidate this. But then he says, then, after in verse 5, then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling, listen to these words because they're all significant. So he trembling, this is St. Paul, well, he's Saul, he becomes Paul, transition. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So he begins as all of us do. 
We begin our lives sometimes and we think we know it all. We got this. But notice how St. Paul, in the, la in the end of this verse, verse 6, he's now trembling and astonished. He went from being up here on his horse with the soldiers. He saw the world in his way. To the point now in verse 6, in just a few verses, now he's on the ground, he's blind, and he's trembling, and he's asking God, who are you? This is a transition that all of us as Orthodox Christians, we all go through at some point in our lives. Um, you know, we, we talked about this, we talked about, you know, uh, the bishop and uh, etc. Sometimes we go through these difficulties in our lives and it wakes us up. It's almost like God says, you know, smacks us a little bit and says, wake up. You don't know me. And I'm going to show you who I am. So, again, I can talk about verse 3 to 6 for the next three weeks, but you won't do it. So, and then his life kind of begins. I have maps and things. By the way, I always tell uh, the servants, sometimes when I speak at St. Mina's, there are maps in the back of the Bible. And a lot of us just skip those maps. Oh, they're nice color. Add some color to the Bible, you know, because the rest of it is black and white. And we think, oh, why, why are those there? Well, they're there because if we don't know where all these cities are, especially in the book of Acts, by the way, and in the epistles of St. Paul, if we don't know where some of these cities are, it's very relevant where they are, actually. It makes a big difference. So anyway, this is just my geography nostalgia. Um, just look at those maps sometimes to relate them to the names of these cities. I won't get into that right now, but basically these are, this is just a slide of some of the facts that we talked about. Notice, I don't know if there's a light here, but no. Is it this? I'm afraid, okay. Yeah, you notice how his name, original name Saul, means asked for, okay? So again, all these things are relevant. He begins with this name, ask the one who's asked for. It's a big deal, okay? And his name changes to Paul, which means little. See, we, we read these verses, we've all read the book of Acts probably, and we just go past it. But the, the scripture is so deliberate in the way it was given to us. Every single word has a significance. So he goes from the one being asked for to little, okay? You're humbled. He's been humbled, okay? Uh, again, his father acquired the Roman citizenship, um, etc. All very significant things. Not something, oh wow, yeah, so he got the Roman citizenship. If it wasn't for that Roman citizenship that St. Paul had, he would not have been able to travel around the empire quite so easily, by the way. So having that Roman citizenship back then was like being in the EU or in the US with a US passport where I can go everywhere without a visa. Having that Roman citizenship was going to become very handy. I always often tell people, especially, um, you know, a lot of us that maybe have the Egyptian background, why did God bring you here? Why did God bring, oh, I got the U.S. citizenship. Who cares? What's the big deal? The big deal is, is that God gave you this for a mission. He didn't just send you here so you could have a nice job and get a nice car. Okay? This is where, what happened with St. Paul. He had that Roman citizenship because it enabled him to spread the word more easily. It's okay. So a lot of us have that now U.S. citizenship. Some of us were born here, which is a blessing. It enables us to spread his word. Um, next slide. Again, just some facts about his life. And 
I'm going to share these slides with you because everything is ba I back everything up with verses from the scripture so that we, we understand because a lot of people say, oh, how do we know this? How do, where do you get that information? It's all here. You just have to look for it. Sometimes um, it's in the epistles. Sometimes it's in the book of Acts. Um, but important uh, stuff to know. So a little bit about his journeys. Now, the fact that he made those four journeys, uh, which are in the book of Acts, and then we see components of them in his epistles. Again, very nice, very cute. Yes, he traveled, he spent years. But why do we need to know that, and why is it relevant to us? So he, he makes four pretty long journeys, by the way. And these journeys, number one, just to go from the his, historical aspect, traveling around the Mediterranean Sea, which is what he was doing, was a very risky thing. In fact, when people, um, sailors, would go out into the Mediterranean, they were not expected to ever come back because it is a treacherous body of water. In fact, uh, I read a statistic that the Mediterranean Sea, if any of you have ever taken a cruise there or whatever, there are all these rocks and currents and undercurrents and things like that, so it makes it a very dangerous body of water. There are more, historically, more ships that were sunk under the Mediterranean Sea than all the bodies of water around the world put together. So for St. Paul to make those four journeys and come back, the Holy Spirit was guiding him and God was protecting him. So that's not irrelevant, okay? It's something that we need to think about. So he makes these four journeys. Um, I put a little bit of a timeline. I know some people get very hung up on dates. And I always say, forget about the dates. They're all very nice to know. They're all approximate. Okay? No one was there, you know, recording exactly the dates. But approximate dates, again, I'll share these slides with you just so you can have for yourself. Um, but he goes through these journeys. Um, and in every journey, by the way, why are those journeys so relevant? They're relevant because St. Paul's style, you know, Abuna was talking earlier about next Friday we're having a meeting for everyone to come and welcome to serve in different capacities. Those journeys were St. Paul's service, okay? He was the ideal servant. So what he was doing was he was going to serve God. And remember, that's who we're serving. We're serving God. We're his tools. As he went to all these different cities, he did a couple of things. And you'll see this. I'm not going to get into every detail. First thing he would do when he would get to a city, he would go visit the temple. The, the Jews were spread all across the Greek islands, Turkey, all the way to Rome. There were Jews in Rome. He would go, begin with prayer, and then he would go out into the, into the city and talk about our Lord Jesus Christ. He would establish a church and then move on to the next city. But he didn't forget about those churches and those people that he established. Something really important for us. All of us, as we meet new people that come into the faith, do we say, oh yeah, congratulations, you were baptized, see you? No. St. Paul knew what it meant to share the word of, of God. He would establish the church, establish the people, and he would go back, and on following journeys, he would do a couple of things. Either... He would revisit some of those churches and people again, or he wrote the epistles, okay? He wrote letters to them, reminding them to keep the faith, and if he knew they were having problems, 
Remember, all of these were people that were pagan religions. They worshipped idols. And a lot of those uh, traditions and beliefs would sometimes like merge into Christianity a little bit. And he would kind of revisit them with letters to remind them, hey, wait a minute, be careful. Let me remind you of the faith. Let me remind you who our Lord Jesus Christ is. By the way, quick question, just a little fact. Out of all his epistles, there's one epistle he wrote before he actually visited that city. One. Does anyone know which one that was? So he, Ephesus, he wrote after he visited Ephesus. Cor the Corinthians, he wrote those letters after he visited Corinth. But there's one letter written to a city, the only one that he wrote before he visited that city. Anyone guess? Which? Romans. Yes. Romans. Yes. So that's just a little factoid. You know, um, he wrote to them before he visited them. Eventually, he would get there. Um, good um, thing to talk about at some point. I want to read to you one sample, it's my favorite, on his second journey, okay? And again, what do we learn from St. Paul? Second journey, um, highlighted in chapter 17 in the book of Acts. So again, what do we learn, what is his message to us today? St. Paul's message to us is that as faithful servants, how do we approach those that are seeking and are hungry for Christ. How do we approach them? Are we approaching them in a judgmental way? Are we approaching people in a way where we're criticizing their current faith? Maybe someone is coming from another faith. Do we go and tell them, you know what? That thing you believe in is really a lot of baloney. Let me tell you the real story. That I'm sure will bring people right to you, you know? Um, by the way, I've talked to, um, so I, I worked a couple of times with Muslims, Pakistani Muslims actually, that were very, very, if you wanna say fanatic, zealous, let's say, zealous, okay? And one of the thing I learned about them is that their faith is so strong, like St. Paul. Remember, he was killing people for his faith. And actually, I learned from St. Paul, and I said, you know what? That strength and that energy of your faith is so strong, I love it. I love it. Imagine what you could do as a Christian. Then they listened. However, I could have gone to them and said, you guys are a bunch of fanatics killing people. Um, I'm sure that would have gone over well. So, um, chapter 17. I want to read to you this. Um, in uh, starting in verse 22 so he goes to Athens Athens was the capital okay of pagan Greek theology okay so if you go to Athens today you'll see you know you have the huge temple up on the hill there were all over the city was decorated with statues of the gods the Greeks had gods for everything everything you could think of God of trees, a God of the sun, a God of chairs, a God of everything had a God because otherwise how could it exist? So they had so many gods, but they figured, you know what, we may have forgotten one. So just in case, let's put a pedestal and label it to the unknown God. So that way we're covered. Because the Greeks were very, you know, philosophicals. They were, they were people that were philosophers and very educated, let's cover ourselves. They were like lawyers, you know? Sorry if anyone is a lawyer, attorney. But they covered themselves, you know, with every little, the fine print. So, he gets to the city. Remember, this is a city he should not even set foot in because chances are he's gonna get killed. But he goes. Verse 22, it's another one of these verses where I have highlighted in my Bible. That's why, by the way, I'm not crazy about a Bible on my phone. Good for a quick reference, but... So anyway, verse 22. 
Then Paul stood, he comes into the city, then he stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, this is their big temple, and said, men of Athens, men of Athens, remember, this is very critical how he's about to approach these people that are very worried about why is this guy here, okay? And he said, men of Athens, I perceive, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Because look at all these gods. Like he has one god. They have like hundreds. They must be so religious. They're like oozing gods. Okay? So, that in all things you are very religious for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So he begins by complimenting them. Compliment does he really believe that these are gods? No, but it doesn't matter. But he begins by complimenting them, like a little bit of honey. You know, do you ever watch Mary Poppins? The song, a little bit of honey goes whatever, or sugar or something. Something sweet, okay? Um, and he begins like that, so now they're listening. What is he going to say next? Okay? He could have begun that talk by saying, Oh men of Athens, you are lost souls. We do that sometimes. And in that case, they would have stoned him immediately, and that would have been the end of Christianity in Athens. Okay? It never would have started to start with. So then he says, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth and so forth. So he begins, and that's what, you know, today we're celebrating, you know, those, uh, you heard already, I'm not going to repeat the sermon. Um, that Deacon Emmanuel uh, told us. Um, but it's all about why, why did God come? Why did our Lord Jesus Christ come? What is he teaching us? What is the Holy Spirit's job in all this? And it is for us to spread his faith. At the end of the day, our mission as Coptic Orthodox Christians is to spread his faith. St. Paul put it all out there. He didn't say, he could have just said, you know, why am I going to give myself this headache? I'm just going to stay back in Judea, in Jerusalem where it's safe, protect myself, don't let anyone in, don't talk to strangers, don't go out, protect yourself and stay in your little cave and you're going to be okay. And then it reminds me of the parable of the talents. What happened to the guy that had the one talent? Anyone remember? He buried it. Okay. I always think of God's gift to us was these talents. And what are these talents? It's the beautiful faith that he gave us, not for us to hold on to, but to share with others. The parable of the talents always reminds me of that. You know, the guy who gets the five invests them and now he has double etc and then the one who had the one buried it why did he bury it because I was I knew you were harsh and I wanted to protect it for you so here it is what ended up with that guy it wasn't pleasant okay he was out in the outer darkness okay um, St. Paul knew this and he said I'm gonna share those talents and invest them at risk for my life um, so again, this is, um, I've given talks before about the journeys themselves, because in each one of those four journeys, there's a lot that happens. You can read it in the book of Acts, but a lot of times when I talk about St. Paul or many of the other apostles, I like us to visualize, like be there with them. That's why I'm not crazy about PowerPoints necessarily. 
I want us to kind of picture being there with them. What did it feel like? What kind of environment were they having to deal with? What were they expecting? You know, a lot of times St. Paul would go preach about our Lord Jesus Christ and ended up having to leave in secret because he was going to get stoned to death. So it doesn't always work out. But sometimes he would go and leave and leaves a lot of fruit behind. Um, so the journeys begin small, they get bigger, he spreads. Um, and actually in these slides, if we had time, I highlighted the significance of each of the journeys. I'll share, I think I'll share these with Father Michael. Um, because it kind of just gives us a little bit of a flavor. Um, one of the things uh, that I did want to highlight in his third journey, just again, I'm highlighting things that I think are relevant. He has to defend himself three times. Okay? And why do I care about this? Because he had to defend himself in front of his own people, the Sanhedrin. He had to defend himself in front of the Roman governor, okay, the governor of the Gentiles. And then he had to defend himself to Caesar himself. Had he not been a Roman citizen, by the way, it would have all ended in front of the Sanhedrin. And that would have been it. No, because he had that Roman citizenship, again, utilizing why did God put us here? There's a reason. He, because of that, he got to stand in front of Caesar. He got to travel to Rome and stand. And by the way, he had to wait a couple of years before he got the audience with Caesar. But imagine that St. Paul who was humbled, was on the ground, blind, okay? ends up in front of getting an audience with Caesar. Wow. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he used everything that happened in his life for the glorification of God, including the meeting in front of Caesar. I could read that to you, but it's interesting. He stands in front of Caesar, and even standing in front of Caesar, who could just go like this and have him killed, he was still preaching in the court in front of Caesar. He used every moment he had to spread that word. I don't know how many times I was on the bus traveling to New York City or on a plane. I'm sure Abuna experiences this because he stands out a little more. Uh, <laughs> and someone, you know, I'm reading something. Oh, what is that you're reading? I could just say, yeah, yeah, yeah it's something. And, or you can use it to glorify God, share it. The worst that will happen is to say, yeah, I'm not interested. But that's the lesson, one of the many lessons that St. Paul, teach, Paul teaches us. How do we use every ounce of talent or every gift that was given to us? And how do we use the Holy Spirit in our lives? How powerful the Holy Spirit is. He did nothing on his own. Nothing. And he proclaims this several times. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit that guided him to, to say every word, to see something like a, a pedestal and make a whole sermon out of that pedestal that just said to the unknown God on it. By the way, just something really small and then we'll, we'll stop. One of the, our beloved apostles that traveled with, with him was this guy called St. Mark. You've heard of him. He founded the Coptic Orthodox Church in Alexandria. And he baptized St. Anianus, the patron saint of this church. St. Mark, just again, to, to give you more St. Mark, actually, St. Paul thought that St. Mark wasn't even ready to travel with him. And he sent him away, actually. I'm, I'm kind of 
over. But he kind of said, oh, you know what, this, this Mark, he's a young kid, he's not ready, eh, go back, go back to wherever you came from. But it's amazing to me that had he not done that, would St. Mark have ever ended up in Alexandria? And St. Mark actually learned a lot from this short time he traveled with St. Paul. He, in fact, used something similar to this story of the unknown God in establishing initial, initially establishing Christianity in Egypt. And that was, some of you probably heard the story, when he met St. Tenianus, he was a cobbler, and St. Mark's, just real quick, St. Mark breaks, breaks his sandal, he goes to the cobbler shop that's owned by Anianas or St. Anianas, and he tells him, I need this fixed. And as St. Anianas is putting the needle through the sandal, he pricks his finger and says, oh my one God, bingo. St. Mark takes that, okay? He learned from St. Paul. He knew the theology of the ancient Egyptians. He knew that they believed that the great god Osiris would um, get together with Isis, a great princess, and they would bear a son, and whose, his name would be Horus. That's the bird god you see on the Egypt air symbol. And Horus would become the one god that would bring peace and prosperity to Egypt. He knew this. And he said, well, let me tell you about the real, true one god. I'm just going to leave you with that. Because God gives us so many opportunities, so many opportunities to spread his word, even plant a little seed. And the trick is, do we see those? Do we take them and make use of them? So I'm going to end here because I could talk about this for weeks and months, um, but I won't. I'll spare you. Um, instead, I'll just send you the PowerPoint. It won't be as nice, you know. But <laughs> um, I want to leave you with this question. After hearing all this and after we heard the sermon earlier today, what do you think? Again, a lot of this you may have already been thinking about. Why does God give us these examples of the saints? Why do we need to know about the saints? Think about that a little bit and what do we learn and how is it relevant? If you notice the title I had in the beginning, what is the relevance, what is he teaching us for our lives today? It's not about some historical thing that happened 2,000 years ago. But why are the saints relevant to our lives today? Your lives. Something to think about.